Hello, welcome. I'm Kevin from Nudge Fitness Clubs of Hamden. Tonight we have the running clinic put on by me, and I will be. Ex I'm excited to share with you some great tips. I know a ton of people have been messaging me all week to uh, hop on here, so we're not going to dive into any nitty gritty until we have a good amount of people live. But anyways, welcome. Uh, we can start. Message into the group. What's your level of running experience? I want to know who I'm talking to. I know a lot of names as I've been talking to people who are excited to be here. Greetings again. I'm Kevin from the edge of Hamden, and I'm here to teach you how to run uh, or fix you or whatever it is for you. I'm very excited to be here. So message in what your experience level is as far as running goes, because I want to make sure I'm addressing your experience level. Um, I've designed this workshop for everyone from beginners to experienced runners. Um, Finley's working on her running form as well. That's her in the background. It's weird because Instagram Live is backwards and Facebook Live is forwards. It's pretty cool. Anyways, um, <clears throat> welcome. As I'll uh, keep an eye on the comments, but if I miss it, then, um, and I don't address it, you can message in again, but I'm going to keep an eye on there. So we got, got a handful of people. I know some people are just going to watch this later, but I'm very excited to share with you some stuff. So I've given you guys three minutes to get on, so anybody else that's not on, they can catch up or watch the replay. Uh, so to start with me, I'm Kevin Gregory, the uh, I train at the Edge Fitness Clubs of Hamden, and a little background on my running experience because you want to make sure you're taking advice from an expert in the area. I don't qualify as an expert or a master yet, I guess. I, have, I don't have 10,000 hours of uh, running experience, but I'm pretty experienced, so I'm going to be able to bring you some good stuff. And my running coach, uh, Richard Diaz, is well beyond a master. He's probably um, put in 50,000 hours over the course of his life. Uh, so I'm going to bring you a lot of the stuff I've learned from him and some other running coaches over the years. Um, checking out some of the answers to my first question I sent you guys about your running experience. We are uh, walking and running, couch to 5k, running circles. It's good, Tom. I know I like to do that too. Uh, beginner, intermediate. That's good. Beginner. I know most of you guys are going to be either beginners or you just – You've been running, it hurts, and you're not sure what you need to do to fix it. But <laughs> good job, Becky. I think I love how there's already a like on there. Um, so we're going to address that, and we'll go over – I guess I'll, I'll finish introducing myself first, and then we'll come back to what I'm going to cover. So, again, I'm Kevin. I, athlete as a kid, I was always a lineman in football, which requires zero running, so you just be heavy and then push people around. Um, so – didn't really get into running until midway through college. I played lacrosse, and running's important in lacrosse to get up and down the field and have gas left to play defense, which was my position, to cover the offensive players, stop them from scoring goals, and so on. I played collegiate lacrosse. Uh, I'd say a pretty high level. We competed against the national champions each year, one or two times a year because of our conference, and uh, running got me on the field there. So that was basically I did as much as I needed to to play, and uh, – after college, I started running more because I found a lot of benefits in it. But those first years running, I had a lot of pains. Knee pain, ankle pain, back pain. I'm sure you guys can relate. A lot of times as a young athlete, I just attributed that to the fact that I was out of shape. Out of shape. It really was because I was out of shape, but it was because my running form was terrible. Or as my running coach says, you can't win if you run like sh <laughs> You know how the rest of the word goes. But anyways, so over the years since then, I've learned a lot more about running. I've done research, and I've learned from other um, experienced runners. Now, I know you can't tell by looking at me right now, but I'll stand up in a little while, and you'll be able to see me a little better. When I started my running running career, I was 225 pounds, not out of shape at all, just that's a lot of weight to be carrying around. So if you think every time you – jam on the ground if you land incorrectly you're creating four times the force of what you weigh on your joints and uh if you've been in a car accident before you know what one time with all that force does to your body so when you're running we're actually beating ourselves up 
and injuring our joints and creating inflammation and creating pain. And if it hurts, you're not going to do more of it, right? <laughs> so I uh, want to improve that. But what I learned is there is another way to run in that you don't injure yourself every step. You can actually improve yourself. And obviously everyone runs because they want to burn calories. Everyone wants to lose weight or look better or whatever that motivation is for you. Um, probably not too many people on this uh, workshop are simply here to just be better runners for the sake of being runners. Sure, you do a 5K, you want to place well in your age group or whatever, or half marathon is up there on your list of things to accomplish in your life, or maybe even a marathon or an ultra marathon or whatever. So that's great. And this is going to help you whether you're trying to run your first ultra marathon or you're trying to run to the end of the block and not die. <laughs> not literally, but you know what I mean. Keel over and be uh, done for the day. So um, back to my story. I know I'm all over the place. It happens. I'm very excited. Okay. Give me some, give me some, uh, some leeway. So after college, I was running a little bit. I started playing semi-pro football. I was still on the defensive line, so I still didn't need to run, but I love running. And then I found this great thing called OPSO course racing. No one knew what it was in 2010, 2011. Um, a couple of my friends found out about it on some Facebook ad, I think. We did a Warrior Dash. Maybe you've heard of that. It's out of business now, so you can't do one. But that was like my gateway drug to uh, OPSO course racing. And after doing that and getting my butt totally kicked, I continued to learn more about running and do more running to get better. Um, still didn't know how to run, just did a lot of it. And now was the time I, uh, I signed up for some longer races, like a Tough Mudder, which was a half marathon distance obstacle race, and then some Spartan races. And from there, that was 2011 was my first Warrior Dash. And then a few months later was my first Tough Mudder. So by 2012, I was looking at Spartan Race because I heard that was really hard and I wanted to try that. And now I started doing a little more running because I knew how much it hurt if you just uh, came into these events out of shape. I was strong enough, obviously. I mean, I'd lifted weights. I was in the gym a lot. But the running piece was my biggest nemesis. Uh, so I did a three-mile Spartan Race and it was really, really hard. And it wasn't as hard as Warrior Dash because Warrior Dash, I was totally out of shape. But now I spent about a year training my running on top of being good at the obstacles. It was still harder, especially the obstacles, but so on. Um, moving on, I did longer. I beat the 5K level, and then I took on the half marathon level. And then progressively, my, my races, I ended up getting – I finished them. That was the goal, finish. Right? It wasn't like I was trying to win or anything. Uh, after all, I wasn't a good runner. So – um, as I got some coaching and running and started to improve my form and I read some books and listened to some podcasts and talked to some coaches and improved all that stuff, then I ended up feeling better running and it didn't hurt so much. And I did some CrossFit also because I wanted to get more jacked because that was always every sport I played. If you were bigger, faster, stronger, then you'd be better on the field. And uh, I was getting way better at these obstacles, but I still – had a lot of opportunity to develop my running. Um, so fast forward, I beat the level of 5K and then half marathon, and then I took on a longer distance. I ran a real road marathon, and that was really hard, but I finished it because I put in a lot of training. And now, like, I've run everything from a 5K or even I think the shortest race I did was the 3K obstacle race uh, all the way up to a 24-hour obstacle race. And I've done seven 24-hour races. It's... I know you're probably like, that's crazy, but really it's just a lot of running and hanging out with friends and you just happen to be moving for most of the time, but it's a blast. It's shown me the world. I've been to Vegas, Atlanta, and Iceland and seen the Northern Lights and it's been a great vehicle for me to do all that. But enough about me. Why are we here? We're here because we want to get better at running or it hurts when we run or you just want to learn. So make sure you guys have a paper and a pen, notebook. I got a little uh, yellow notebook here and a pen. You're going to want to write down a lot of stuff. Uh, you can watch this again later, but take notes. And if you watch it later, you'll pick up different things. And the point here is just to give you some tools that you can apply immediately and change some awareness so that way you can become better each day at running. And if you end up liking it, you might actually get good at it and it won't hurt so much. And you can use it as another tool. This isn't designed to replace anything, but 
you can use that as another tool in your toolbox for your fitness. And now uh, we're not supposed to be going to the, the gyms closed, but we shouldn't be congregating in parks and all that stuff. But guess what? The great outdoors is pretty vast and you can do a lot of running outside without interacting with people and you can get your fitness on and whatever that looks like for you. Um, there's roads, sidewalks, trails, um, paved or otherwise wooded, and they all have their benefits of training on them. Um, so we'll talk about those a little bit as we go, but that's not really the focus. So why run? What inspired me? I mean, sports, obviously sports performance is huge, but I read this book when I started getting into running called Born to Run uh, by Chris McDougall. It really, I don't know how I found it. Someone said something, I read the cover and I was like, I got to read this book. I started reading it. This guy's 250 pounds. So that resonated with me because I'm a big guy. I mean, if you go to watch a marathon on TV, you see these Kenyans and these really fast runners and what they look like. Little stick figures that are 130 pounds that are men that are like five foot six. I'm six foot three and 225 when I started running. So way bigger than the average runner. Um, but that should give you guys some, some hope that you can run too. And it's just a matter of learning and good form that's going to get you to be able to do that without all the pain or discomfort. I mean, breathing, if you have asthma and you can't breathe, that's fine. You just need to learn how to breathe. It's not as simple as remembering to breathe, but there's some techniques we'll talk about. Um, so that book inspired me. I read that. Um, he talks about how he went to Mexico and ran with the Tarahumara Indians, who are these native runners that live in the mountains and eat corn stuff. And great book. Check it out. Even if you listen to it on Audible, listen, I guarantee you cannot read or listen to that book and not be inspired to get outside and go try to run. So uh, check that out. But um, after that, I read some other reading books or read some other running books. Uh, Dean Karnazes, Ultra Marathon Man. It blew my mind that someone could run a marathon every day for 50 days and not die. Um, but it expanded my mind. And in my head at that point, I just thought like before these books, I was like, oh, running. You know, the football practice, we're tired, and then we got to run across the field down and back, and then we're gassed, and we're going to throw up, and then we do it again, and then we do it until the coach gets tired. And and that was running to me, and I saw the soccer team running laps around the field for, like, our whole practice, and I thought they were stupid for playing soccer because they don't actually get to play their sport. Um, track, same thing. I just – I really had <laughs> different feelings about running prior to finding this love and joy. So if you're in that – that mindset of I hate running right now, it's that's totally okay. Normal. You just haven't found your why to running yet. But my goal here is to introduce you to some different ideas and maybe you'll try running and maybe it'll work out for you and you'll love it at least a little bit just to have it as, like I said, another tool in your toolbox for fitness. So we'll, uh, we'll dive in with that. So we already talked about messaging your level of running experience. If you are on already from the beginning, you already did that. But if you're new, then throw that in there. I've been reading. It is a Boston Terrier. <laughs> she's awesome. She uh, got stepped on on Sunday, so she's running around on three legs. So if you see her, she's, I don't know, she didn't yelp, but she's recovering <laughs> from our run. Um, so my purpose of this is, again, share with you some basic tips increase your self-awareness, and get you out the door. Ready, fire, aim. <laughs> I know it's ready, aim, ready, aim, fire usually, but I want to get you ready, get you outside and doing something, and then we can step back and reevaluate. So I'll give you tips for each phase of that. So we're not going to hang up the call and go outside and run right now, but we're going to do some interactive stuff if you want to participate. Um, we're also going to look at your shoes. I'll show you what to look for on those. And what else? Well, we'll talk about, I might as well just give you the rundown. We're going to talk about common injuries, common mistakes, recovery techniques, proper form, and designing a running program from <laughs> start to finish. So we, all right, thanks for messaging. Cool. So we'll cover each of those. This is going to go till 830. So if I run out of time, then I'm sorry. Then we'll have to do another one. But I have plenty of material to keep us occupied. So Education first, then we'll do some application, and then we'll do some reflection. Uh, so common injuries. I already talked about all the pains I had when I first started running because I'd run around the 
the field and practice or whatever it was, or I'd run on my own to get ready for sports. Um, I also wrestled and played lacrosse and football in high school. So three sport athlete, wrestling doesn't have running involved, but wrestling has a lot of running and training, which is annoying uh, when you're a heavier weight and you got to run against the little guys, but got a lot of practice running wrong. So once uh, I started making changes, it was apparent quickly that I was changing and I was getting better, which you should feel like you're getting better, but your body's got to adapt. So um, if you can't, Message in if you can still see me because my screen went black. Yeah, Patrick. Can you guys still see me and hear me? Yep. All right. Great. So if you can still see me and hear me, I'm just going to keep talking, but I don't want to keep talking to no one. So as long as you guys can see me and I can't see, that's fine. All right. Perfect. So where was I? All right. Come running injuries, your knees. Some of us already have knee pain and then we run and it gets worse. Uh, ankles. You may or may not have ankle or foot pain, but it's probable that you could have that depending on how you land on your foot. Hips and back, this is a huge one. A lot of us already have back pain from sitting all day. We're sitting in this crouched, rounded shoulders and our back's getting weak. And then we get really tight in the hip flexors and the, the front. And then we go try to run and that pulls our hips into a different rotation. And then that creates more back pain. Shin splints, thanks for sharing that, Caitlin. Uh, shin splints, I think, now that I think back, that was my first running injury. This pain that you get in the front of your shin that feels like they're breaking. And, uh, yeah, so those are some common ones. You may have other pains, but those are the big ones. So common mistakes, it's all about how you're landing, all right? So if you're running and you're landing on your heel, that is going to cause so much impact on – your body. That's where I <laughs> stand up straight, Heidi. That's where I mentioned before, if you're running and you hit the ground, you create four times the impact of your body weight on all your joints. The way I always like to describe this is we've probably all been in a car with a new driver. Uh, plantar fasciitis is definitely a huge one. We'll talk about that too. All right. So heel striking. If you're driving in a car with a new driver, they hit the gas, and then they hit the brake, and then the gas, and the brake, and the gas, and the brake. And you're bucking around like you're riding in a rodeo or something. That's how it is on your body when you're running and landing on your heels. Your heels are the brakes, and then as you tow off, that's the gas. So your body is going through this constant shaking and, and slamming and all that stuff. So if you're not sure if you run on your heels, take off your shoe. I don't have any shoes that I wore before I fixed my running form, but don't worry, Gary, we'll get to that. We're just going over common problems right now. All right, so I found this old shoe that I wore when I was uh, dressing up all the time. So look at this corner. This is, I know it's old and beat up shoe, but this back side of the heel, see how that's worn out? That's where I land on this shoe. This is obviously not a running shoe, but if you look at your running shoes, you can quickly tell where you're landing most of the time. So if you see that there, then you're gonna have a lot more impact on that part of your shoe. And that means you're landing on your heels. Another thing you can do is just set up your phone and run past your phone. And you'll see you're landing on your heels because it's apparent. <laughs> your legs, it's also called overstriding because you're stretching your leg out so far that your knee's locking out, which makes more strain, right? And then we're pulling our toe towards our knee because we want the heel to hit, we think. That's activating your anterior, anterior tibialis, the, the shin muscle, basically. And what happens when we work out the same muscle too much? It gets sore. <laughs> That's what shin splints is. If you do too many push-ups, your pecs are going to be sore, your triceps are going to be sore. If you keep pulling your knees up towards, or your toes up towards your knees and keep running and landing on your heels, that muscle in front of your shin is going to get tired really fast. It doesn't have the endurance. It's not designed for that. 
So landing on your heels is going to cause a lot of problems uh, with all the joints, the feet, the ankles, the shin splints, the knees, and then up in the hips and the back. Your glutes are probably deactivated because you're not using them. So your quads are going to be over, over activated, and that's going to put more strain on your knee joint because they're not balanced out by the hamstring, which is on the back of your leg. So that's going to create more knee pain. And then you're back from all the jarring and all that stuff. If you've ever had, if you've ever been in an accident and gotten whiplash, you know like what that big jarring incident can do to your joints and nerves and your neck specifically, or maybe your back. But running in like that is going to cause the same thing. All right, so common mistakes. Now fixing your form. That's the number one way, or we'll talk about recovery techniques next, but the number one way to do this is fixing your form. So the big thing here is to land on the right side of your foot. I'm just going to bring up the live feed on my phone because I can't see myself and I'm about to move. And I want to see where I land in the camera. And it sounds silly, but I don't want to be uh, missing the camera. All right, take out a pen, write down common injuries, and then write down your common injuries. What have you experienced in the past? What's your issue? And then write down your common mistakes based on what I told you. If you don't think you're a heel striker, that's okay. You probably are, but we'll prove it to you later. Um, where is this? I shared with all of you guys how to get onto the live. And then, oh, there we go. Perfect. <laughs> all right, there we go. All right, I just want to be able to see myself. All right, perfect. So, fixing your form. Everyone stand up. I'm going to back up so you can see. Take off your shoes and move your Finley. You can come. Jess wants to participate too, so she'll be in here. So, first of all, before we do anything with your legs, we got to have good posture. Right, Heidi? Stand up straight. So, First, we're going to stand up tall, chest is up. Most of you, because you've been sitting at a desk all day or sitting on the couch, you're probably a little rounded forward. Stand up as tall as you can, chest is up, shoulders back. Squeeze your shoulder blades together, brace your core, and your hands should be next to your sides now. If they're still up here, your shoulders aren't back. Embrace your core. All right, that's good posture. Then, to run, we're going to bend our elbows to 90 degrees, relax our hands. I'll get a little closer so you can see my hands. So we're holding, like we're holding a spatula. But the elbow's at 90 degrees. I'm going to pull that back. All right, now we're in good posture. And now we can start marching in place. So we're going to pick up one foot. Bring that same side back. The other side can come up a little bit. And then switch. And then switch. And then switch. Keep your eyes straight ahead as if you were running, because obviously you want to pay attention to where you're running. All right, Me message in if you're participating in this. How many of you guys are actually participating and who's just taking notes? Jess is gonna be our little coachable mannequin as well. But message in if you're participating and tell me what you're seeing. So what we want to do is, let's back up a little bit, Jess. All right, turn sideways. All right, keep those elbows at 90. All right, so Jess is standing tall, her chest is up, shoulders are back, her eyes are straight forward. And she's just bringing that knee up and swinging the opposite arm back. And I want to know what you guys, what part of your foot is it landing on the floor? Are you landing on your heels? Or are you landing on a different part of your foot? <laughs> and if so, how would you describe that? All right, good. Glad you guys are participating. Phew. Got to hit all the kinesthetic, auditory, and visual uh, learning styles. 
right? That way it sticks better. All right, so frozen, damn. All right, well, I see your message. People are participating. All right, good, Sandy, the ball of your foot, your forefoot, your midfoot, not your heel. No one said heel, good. This is how you run. This is just a matter of going a little shorter. The point here is to practice the basics. So this is super basic. It's kind of goofy, I know, but this is gonna teach you to land on the right part of your foot. Warning, warning, warning. If you do too much running after we change your form, you're gonna be sore in new places. So when you start doing this tomorrow, cause it's dark out, unless you're going out for a nighttime run, your Achilles and your calves are gonna be really sore cause they're gonna be activated. You're gonna be using them, which is good. We wanna have used those. But remember, like I said, with the shin, you can rest for a second. <laughs> I know you guys are probably tired too. We can take a break for a second. So that muscle in the front of your shin is going to fatigue. So same as your hamstrings or your hamstrings, your uh, calves and Achilles. We can build those up. They will build up, but we want to do that gradually. Just like if you've been out of the gym for over a year, you don't come back and take the hardest hit class and expect to be able to walk the next day. You don't do a thousand squats and be able and expect to be able to sit on the toilet and not need the handrail to get off, right? So ease into it. Practice is important, but don't overdo it. So Jackie, arms stay the sides, they don't cross over the front at any time. Good question. So just march forward. Do not <laughs> all right. So see her zipper. Do what you're supposed to do. Oh, sorry. All right. So see Jess's zipper, her arms are staying outside of her center line, her arms, and she's gonna manage that by keeping her chest up and shoulders back. So the center line is not gonna be crossed. Demonstrate bad form. All right, so this, think of this like a washing machine. Have you ever seen a washing machine run a, uh, <laughs> win a race? No, it's twisting, it's wasting all this energy in rotation. So. If the arms are going forward and back, they're propelling you forward. That's where we're running, right? Forward, we're not running in circles. And if we do run in circles, we're running forward in circles. <laughs> all right, so, all right, take a break. Thanks. All right, so big things here, write these down. So take a short break. Number one, Ie, what's number one? I forgot. Yes, lots of wasted energy. Heidi, what's number one rule to running place? If you don't message them, assuming that you dropped off and you're napping. I'm just kidding. It's okay. All right. Since she didn't message in, rule number one, good posture. So stand tall, chest is up, shoulders back and down. Brace the core. Sort of easy. We're going to go over running programming at the end. So step one, good posture. Core goals. You can you can run in anything. We just ran barefoot. Um, obviously, you don't want to run barefoot on asphalt. If you've ever done that as a kid at a, at a pool, you get raw feet, and then you can't walk for a few days. Good job, Heidi. So uh, we'll talk about shoes in a second, too, and all that stuff. But so number one, good posture. Number two, bend the elbows in 90 degrees. So we already have our good posture. Bend the elbows in 90 degrees. And then we're going to work the opposite knee and opposite arms. And we're going to pull the knee up and land on the forefoot. I know this seems really slow. That's good. You don't get good at running by running fast. You get good at running by practicing slow and then improving your form. And only then are you allowed to run fast. Otherwise, you're just going to be back in the same vicious cycle, destroying your body, creating more pain and so on. All right, so those are the easy tips. So now I'm gonna play this wonderful sound for you. So get back to your feet and listen up. <laughs> Not that sound. All right, so if any of you have been in the music, performing arts, if you will, uh, you've used the metronome. So guess what we're gonna use? A metronome. The metronome's set to 180 beats per minute, and that's how many steps per minute you're gonna take. That's if you're practicing by running in place, 
or if you're running slow, like a, I don't know what slow, maybe call it a 15 minute mile, or if you're running fast, you can still maintain 180 steps per minute running a six minute mile or whatever fast is for you. So I'm gonna turn this volume up so you can hear that. You're not gonna be able to hear me very quick, but watch this and I'll run with her. You can hear the beat, so you're gonna practice too. Every time you hear the beat, one foot goes down. Finley, that's not the beat. Finley. Still chest is up, shoulders are back. 90 degrees in the elbows. Landing softly on the forefoot. Landing softly. Hey guys, quick, if we're landing softly, are we creating a ton of impact? No, that's the point. What we are doing, I'll break that. I can do this all day. I'm sure you guys need a break. All right, so what we can do is, where was I going? No impact, low impact. All right, so if you can't move that fast, that's okay. It took me a while to build up to 180, but you can run at 180 after you practice and that becomes your new norm. And that's gonna keep your heart rate down. Your heart rate's down, then you can breathe. And if you can breathe, then you feel good. If you can't get your, if you can't do that with your knees that high, you could do it barely picking your knees up off the ground. Just get practice with that. 180 steps per minute on the metronome. That, know what? <laughs> Tina, I did it for 12 hours. It worked fine. I didn't listen to the beat, but that's my that's programmed in my brain. I did a lot of uh, practice with this. I put headphones on and just listened to that beat, and it kind of mesmerized me, but it really taught me how many steps per minute, whether I was running a slower speed or a faster speed. The only difference is – get out of here. The only difference is you're leaning. So if you're jogging in place, you're vertical – if you're jogging slowly, you're slightly bent at the ankles, not at the knees, not at the back. You're not hunched over running. You're bent at the ankles, which obviously you're going to lean forward. Running is a series of falling and catching yourself. That's basically it. Running is a series of single leg hops <laughs> or eccentric hops. So if you're running in place, you're vertical. If you're running slow, you're slightly leaning forward. If you're running fast, you're, you're much more more aggressive lean. And all you're doing is catching yourself every time you fall from landing on your face. So that's the gist of that. Now, as far as strength training for, <laughs> strength training for running, how many legs are we on at a time when we run? Only one. So if we're doing bilateral or double leg movements, then that's great, we're strengthening our muscles, but we're not challenging ourselves in the same way that we're gonna be challenging ourselves when we're running. So the, you're not really training your running muscles the way they would specifically for what you're trying to do. 90 speed, try to do one foot landing. Yeah, I like it, Tom. You can overlay your music with your metronome too, so that way you can enjoy that part or whatever else you want to listen to. Sometimes podcasts, you can hear them while you're uh, – while you're running and the beeping doesn't interrupt it. So proper form, that is the gist of everything. It's really simple. It's just not so simple to, I don't know. It's really simple in theory. You just have to apply it, but it's baby steps. You're not gonna go out and run five miles tomorrow changing your form. In fact, if you already run 10 miles a, a day or a week or a clip, and then you, yes, good job, Jennifer. In Pandora, it has a uh, station you can set the beats per minute. So if you're already running 10 miles a, a day or in a clip, do not change your form from what you're doing to what I'm showing you and go for 10 miles. You're going to trash yourself. You're going to be on the couch for three days. You're going to hurt in new places you never felt before. So ease into it. If right now you can run from here to the end of the block and you're probably going to throw up, then start easy. Just 
Maybe go to the end of the driveway and practice, take a really long break, catch your breath, and so on. All right, so that's running form. Next, we'll talk about breathing. Breathing's huge. Cycling breathing is even more important. If you're going to go running for any amount of time, I mean, if you take a hit class, you're drinking water sometime, right? So you're probably going to have some water when you're running. Maybe you won't. It's up to you, but breathing's key. If you want a really hard test, take a big sip of water. Fill up a mouth with water and then run without swallowing. That's going to force you to breathe out of your nose. Breathing nasally or intranasal breathing is the key to keeping your heart rate down and manageable. Think about it. Any time meditation, they say breathe in your nose. If you have anxiety and you breathe in, do breathing exercises, breathe in your nose. Breathing in your nose is going to settle down your fight or flight mechanism and relax you. Even though you're running, <laughs> which is the opposite, you can bring your heart rate and anxiety down by breathing in your nose. But you can only do that if you're running at a certain speed. The goal here is if you're new to running or terrible at it, your heart rate's gonna spike as soon as you take four steps. So slow down, you don't have to go anywhere fast. You're already, walk if you walk, then that's fine. Just have a little bounce in your step. Don't worry about the 180. Just land on the right part of your foot and try to breathe in your nose as often as you can. You're probably not gonna be able to do every breath, but you can breathe in every few breaths. Like, <sighs> you don't wanna sound like a dog panting. <laughs> that's, that's the opposite of what you wanna do. But breathe in your nose and that's gonna settle down your central nervous system so that way you can relax. And if you can relax, again, if you enjoy this, then you're going to be able to do more of it. And if you can do more of it, you're gonna get more results because you're more willing to do it more consistently. Um, but it's the same with exercise. If you have one workout at the gym and it's three hours long, you're not gonna get out of bed for the rest of the week. You're not working out at all. So it's better to do small chunks of the practice each day, take a rest day in there somewhere, but five, five days of running practice is gonna yield you way better results and you'll feel better when you're not running because your body's not gonna be trashed uh, than one really hard long day. So keep that in mind. Breathing, anything else on breathing, you guys get it? Breathe in your nose, stop panting like dogs. No chest breathing, <laughs> breathe into your belly. I don't know if you can see my belly. Put your hand on your belly, put your hand on your chest. Take a deep breath in through your nose. Push it out your belly. <sighs> Ideally, you want to breathe into both at the same time, but most of you, if you don't know how to belly breathe, are just going to breathe into your chest. So just focus on belly breathing. And then when you master that, you can breathe into both at the same time. The goal here, the belly, you breathe in, your lungs expand down, you get more oxygen in. That helps keep you aerobic. For those of you that don't know the science behind it, uh, your body only burns fat when it's aerobic. So when it's above aerobic, you're burning glycogen, which is not fat. So beating yourself into the ground, sprinting to the end of the block as hard as you can and throwing up, not serving purpose, not getting you what you probably want, just based on percentages. Some of you don't care about losing weight or anything, but a lot of people want to lose some fat, tone up or whatever your goal is. So that's just tip there. All right, proper form. We got the running form, the breathing form. Anything else that you want to hear about specifically with what I just covered? Did I breeze over something too fast or um, something you didn't understand? I mean, you can breathe through your mouth. Just breathe in your nose as often as you can. If you're increasing your speed, excuse me, you're going to breathe through your mouth. But if you can take every other breath in your nose or every three breaths in your nose or every four breaths in your nose, that's gonna help you settle your nerves down, settle your heart rate down, and that's gonna allow you to go longer. Think endurance, running economy. There's two ways to increase your running economy. Think of a car, really. Let's go with the car analogy. If you have a V8 and you floor it, you're just burning so much gas. Are you going anywhere? Depends on what kind of engine. And if it's like a sports car, you're gonna go really fast, but you're still burning a lot of gas. Are you going to make it that far? Probably not. The miles per gallon is probably terrible. But if you ease on the gas, even in an eight cylinder, even a six or a four, if you ease on the gas, you're going to take off, not at the same 
craziness. The engine's not going to rev as high, but you're going to be able to drive much farther on that same tank of gas. So think about that way. That's fuel economy. This is running economy. Great shoes. I'll do new shoes next. Um, so that's that. All right, next, shoes. People always ask me what kind of shoes. I say get your feet are weak. That's the number one thing. Your feet have been boxed up in this mattress. Just some, This is what most people's shoes are. Ready? Take this huge cushion, put your foot in it, and that's your shoe. We're trying to, what, protect our feet from what? All we're doing is dampening the ground response on our foot and our muscles, and we're weakening our feet even greater. If you have plantar fasciitis, it's probably related to weak feet in some way, and that's what you need to do. Orthotics, don't get me started on that, but not a big fan. Fix your feet by strengthening them, not by putting band-aids on them. So take these mattress shoes off, stop spending $200 on these huge cushions, and find, I'll give you, I'm not gonna tell you what brand you have to buy. Obviously everyone's feet are different, but strengthen your feet. Um, number one, balance on one foot. We talked, so some strength training tips real quick. Stand on one foot, balance. Stand there for two minutes. You're gonna start burning. Where is that burning? You're gonna have some in your calves. You're gonna have some in your knees. Probably not, not your knees specifically, but you'll have it in your calf, you'll have it in your glute, you'll have it in a few different places. That's good, you wanna identify those places because that's gonna tell you where you're weak. Your feet are probably gonna get a little warm. Your big toe, grab the ground with that. That's gonna create more activation and that's gonna help you balance and stronger feet and all that. Um, think about, you guys ever see Die Hard 1 where Bruce Willis is on the plane and that business guy is like, make sure when you get off the plane, get into the hotel, take off your shoes and socks, make fists with your feet. There's a lot of truth to that. Do that. Make fists with your feet. Just go right now, either, whether you're wearing shoes or barefoot or whatever, make fists with your feet. It's most fun on carpet, but that's going to activate the muscles in the bottom of your feet. The more active those muscles are, the more structure and stability. Whole different note, shock absorbers. Think about your car. If you've blown a shock or a strut, you know what happens to your car. It's not good. You need those tools and those pieces to the car for you to have a smooth ride. If you're landing on your heels and you're using these big mattress shoes, your body is just getting, it doesn't matter how much cushion you have, I mean, if you jump onto like an air platform, that's great, but then you're dampening your response and your strength and your speed and all those other things. So using your natural shock absorbers, which are this little connected tissues in your feet, ankles, and your Achilles and your calves and your hamstrings and your knees, all that stuff, the little connected tissues, those are the ones you want to strengthen. Don't worry about strengthening your quads. You're probably overdoing that on, that, on them already. Your glutes are dormant from sitting, so you could do some glute activations. Core strength, you should be strengthening your core and activating at all times anyway. If you, if you have proper posture, chest up, shoulders back, brace your core. That's activating your core. Your core is gonna keep you upright. Not good, good, brace. Brace your core. <clears throat> but strengthen your feet, it's like, if you don't have strength, strong feet, it's like driving a car with a flat tire. You can do it, but you're not gonna get very far. And it's gonna destroy your car, rim, axle, whatever. So strengthen your feet. All right, back to the shoes. <laughs> Huge tangent, but here's what you wanna look for. Take out your pen and the paper. Stop buying these shoes that have like a two inch heel on them. Ladies, can you run in high heels? No. So why are you buying sneakers that are basically wedges? Stop. So first, if you have bunions or foot problems, you need room in your shoes. If you wear these super crunched up tight shoes, I've seen what women wear for dress shoes. That hurts their feet. I can't even, I don't know. They, you guys, I don't know how you deal with it, but get shoes with a wide toe box. See how, see how wide this toe box is? My foot's not that wide, but that gives me room to splay my toes. Then if you can splay your toes, they can do their job better. They're not on top of each other. So that's number one. Two, zero drop. 
you don't have to get a zero drop differential. Zero drop just means between the ball of the foot and the heel. So if you measure this, you measure this, that's the same exact distance. Zero drop, that's what I recommend working towards. But if you've been in a high heel shoe, don't worry about getting zero drop. Just get less than 12 or try to get in the single digits. If you've been in like a 12 millimeter drop for a while, get it down to like a nine or whatever. So shouldn't try to be Mario Andretti. All right. So are you talking about your shoes or your car? All right. So I like this brand. It's called Topo Athletic. I'm not telling you to go buy these shoes. I'm just showing you what features you should look for. There's other shoes that have the same features like Ultra. I like those too, but these are just the shoes I've been running in recently. These are my road shoes. So there's some cushion because when you step on a rock, it's gonna hurt. If you notice the wear pattern, remember the heel and the dress shoe? Dress shoe, heel, worn down, heel striking. This shoe, I don't know how many hundreds of miles are on this shoe. You can see that the ball of the foot's wearing out pretty well. I probably shouldn't wear these anymore. Pushes right in. <laughs> but the heel is pretty good. There's very little wear there. So proper foot strike. What else you guys want to know about shoes? If you land properly, your foot will feel the ground. This is a good practice, especially now it's getting nice out. Take off your shoes barefoot. Walk around the grass. I know it sounds hokey, but walk around the grass. Your foot is going to get grounded and earthed. And I don't know, you can Google it. There's plenty of research out there. Um, all that shoes. I don't know how many. <coughs> all right. You want to know who tells you to change shoes every so many miles? The shoe companies. They want you to keep buying more shoes. Otherwise, they don't make any money on you. If your shoes fit and you don't hurt, keep wearing them. If they wear out and there's a hole in them, then yeah, you need new ones. But I just showed you this one. There's almost a hole here. I probably shouldn't wear these, but they're so comfy. I just keep using them. Uh, yes. Will be posted later. Change shoes. Well said. Flat feet. Yeah, your flat feet are flat because there's no muscle to create an arch. You know the arches? Not McDonald's. That's, <laughs> we've all made bad decisions. The arches in like the ancient times, the arch is the strongest uh, shape because, it, yeah, I'm not going to go over that. But strengthen your arches by doing the, the balance drill. It's called Yonda short foot. Don't worry about that. Just balance on one foot. Let that thing light up and burn. If you get to two minutes, you're going to feel it. If you can't, work up to it. If your balance is terrible, that's because you have weak feet. Work on it. If you need some help initially, hold on to a door frame, a broomstick, or something, and that's going to help strengthen your feet. Just start with the making fists with your feet and the balance drills. Another one, I didn't bring it in here, and I'm not going to leave you guys here while I go chase it. Actually, wait, maybe it's right. Oh, it is. If you're, already a, if you're already pretty good at balance and you want to strengthen your feet some more, Grab a foam wedge. I don't know how fast they're shipping on Amazon, but I think this was 11 bucks. You could build one in the garage if you have some wood. And you put it down, stand on it, same deal. Whew. Get your breath and balance and stand. You can do this facing uphill. This is a good one. Facing along the hill or along the hill the other way or even downhill. So that'll be good. You can also do some stand and balance and hip hinges. Pause and get your balance and then come up. All that's gonna light up your glutes, glute med, and your ankles and all that stuff that you need to strengthen. All right, recommendation for adjusting stride on roads. All you need to do is match 180 steps per minute. Your stride will be what it is, and you'll land on your forefoot. Running on the left side of the road kills the left outside ankle. Strengthen your feet and your ankles. The balance board, the slant board, that'll help develop the lateral movements. As runners, if all you do is run forward, you're only training in one plane. So you need to work lateral movements. So those offset balances, like balancing your ankle on the – the balance board sideways will strengthen your ankles. 
these exercises, I showed you what three, those three things are all I've done in the last 10 years to bulletproof my ankles. I run in the woods a lot, step on rocks, roots, tree branches, mud, all kinds of things. I've rolled my ankle off of things and it has been resilient because of these strengthening exercises. And think of it this way, the worst ankle thing possible of what you step off a curb and just think about your ankle bone getting to the ground before your foot. Painful, right? Doing that in the woods is the same thing, but if you strengthen it, you're gonna have more awareness. You're gonna feel the ground better. You're gonna be able to adjust. Think of like an all wheel, maybe like a Subaru. If you're driving an all wheel car and the right front tire slips, the other three kick in and make up for it. So that's what you wanna have your body do while you're running. Uh, whether you're on a road, run some trails too. If your foot hurts, I'm not saying go find like a super hilly trail, but just run off of pavement and that alone, I'll get that to, to that in a minute, Learn That alone will help strengthen your lateral movements and balance. All right, uh, moving on. So developing a running program and then we'll do recovery techniques. I know we already talked about that fixture form, but we'll come back to a couple of things. So design a running program. If you're brand new, don't run too much too early. If you've been running already, that's fine. First of all, fix your form, but take out this, take out your pen, write this down. Pick how much time you're gonna run for a given week. Space out those days based on your experience. If your experience is zero, then run on Monday and Thursday. Maybe start two days, that's it. All right, then take that, let's just say 10 hours to be e easy. So let's say Lauren Biller runs 10 hours a week. We're going to do 20% of that total time. So that's two hours for her. 20% of that total time is going to be on form. That's it. So 180 beats per minute. Beep, 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 beep. Just practice that for 20% of the total time you're going to run. If you um, are brand, brand new, then that's going to be 100%. <laughs> Uh, then 60%, six zero percent is going to be slow running. So if you're running 10 hours a week, six hours of that is just going to be slow, casual. You should be able to have a conversation with your friend who's running right next to you the whole time. Uh, I'll talk about increases in a second. So 60% slow, have conversation. You should be able to breathe in your nose the entire time. Then the other 20%, Speed, you can work on your speed, but 80% of your time, you're running with good form at a slow pace. And only then will you develop the habits correctly to not get hurt and run properly and all that stuff. So only 20% of that speed. So for speed, if you don't have good running form, practice running uphill, because that's gonna force you to land on your forefoot. If you're still heel striking, don't do any speed until you can land on the forefoot. So run slow or run up a hill. Go to a hill. If you're in Hamden, go to Skiff Street. Run up the sidewalk, walk right down. Run up the sidewalk, walk right down for 20%. All right, if you're brand new, start out with 15 minutes at once. Don't go more than that. Again, you're going to be, you don't want to overdo it. You might, the goal is to make you not sore in two days. You should feel a little something, but you shouldn't be like, oh my God, because you're never going to do it again. Um, the book at the beginning, Born to Run. I'm about to recommend another book too, though. So this is my running coach, Richard Diaz. He wrote this book, My Best Race. Running programming. If you're trying to train for something, this has probably everything I just went over and way, way more. It's like an encyclopedia. Preparation. Classify myself as a runner. Motor skill development, aerobic capacity. And in the back, it has like all these templates for beginner, intermediate, and advanced runners for different distances. I think it's like less than 20 bucks on Amazon. Again, I don't know how long shipping, but My Best Race by Richard Diaz. Great book for running, running and programming that. Um, don't worry about your distance at all, period. If you're new, the distance doesn't freaking matter. <laughs> Work on your body. Work on the development. Form over everything. Don't worry about distance. Go, um, yeah, just work on distance. Uh, 
we're going to wrap this up at 8.30, so I want to stick to the time schedule. Two more things I want to talk about quick are recovery. If you already have injuries, you're already hurting, great. That's probably why you're here. Um, strengthen everything. You can get oh, – I have a green mini band. I posted a video on my Facebook the other day. You put it around your knees. You do lateral steps with a mini band. It goes around your knees. They're cheap. Imagine this green band around my knees. That's lighting up your glute knees. These very inactive, underactive muscles because they get stretched out from sitting all day. And then your hips are tilted forward because these are tight. So get a mini band. That's going to be part of your activation exercises before you try to run. And that's going to activate your glutes so they kick in and fire as well. Other than that, that's preparation. You can do leg swings as well. My leg swings. Chest is up, forward and back. Again, we're trying to open up these hip flexors that have been dormant and shortened. So that'll help you. All right, that's your pre-run prep. Now, if you have injuries, you have pain, there's things I like to use. Um, I ran 55 miles in 12 hours 10 days ago. I've run many miles since. My body was definitely sore after that. I had tightness, soreness in my foot, just different tendons and things. But rock tape, it's my go-to for um, a, lot, a lot of aches and pains that are associated with tendons, ligaments, and joints. Here's why. The rock tape pulls the skin away from the uh, lymphatics, creates room in the lymphatic system, fresh fluids come in, flush it out, decrease inflammation, all that stuff. So rock tape, you can use other KT tape, but rock tape's my favorite, and this is H2O. So with opposite races, we get wet a lot, so it lasts for me for a while. Another thing I like to use um, is some CBD cream. I've tried a bunch. I don't have a brand that I recommend strongly, but I won this one. It's Riverbend CBD Muscle and Joint Rub. Uh, so this is more of a balm. And then this one is just a lotion. So uh, you want full spectrum, not just some hemp seed stuff, but that is going to help, again, decrease inflammation. The goal here is get inflammation out. If you can get the inflammation out, your body's gonna be able to process and recover and get you back to running faster. Take cold showers, that'll shock your system. Um, <laughs> I know, no one wants to hear that, but contrast showers are the easier mental way to do it. Get in a hot shower, turn the hot water off, the cold water on, <laughs> for 15 seconds, then put the hot water back on. Do that two or three times. Um, you can take up some salt baths with hot water. Uh, Gary, that was my best race. I'll, yeah, someone else type that in for me. My Best Race by Richard Diaz. All right. And then last, oh, I'll leave you with this quote. Yes. Another great book. Nothing to do with running, but I read this this morning. I thought it was awesome. Turmeric, great supplement for natural decreasing of inflammation. Yes, My Best Race by Richard Diaz. All right. So this quote, I'll just read it word for word instead of paraphrasing. So the speaker, the, the author says, often when I'm speaking to a few hundred people, I ask a volunteer, if I'll ask, I'll ask you guys since you're here, but if you're a runner, great. If not, that's okay. How far do you believe you can run without stopping? So ask yourself that question. You don't have to message it in, but ask yourself how far you can run without stopping. It might be a block. It might be a mile. It might be 10 miles. Now multiply that times five. So if you can run a mile without stopping, times five. Take that new number. So if I ask, all right, I already got that. So let's use Jody as an example. I know she can run one mile at least. So Jody, let's assume there's someone in your life that you love. Let's assume your husband. And if you don't run nonstop for five miles, then re recharge. All right, I'll start from the top. <laughs> Ask how far they believe they can run without stopping. Some will stay a block, some will stay a mile, whatever they say, make it significantly longer, like three to five times longer. So if someone says they can run a mile, ask if they could run five miles nonstop. They will invariably say no. 
So pick a number of an of a distance you can run that scares the crap out of you. Whatever that is. If you've run a half marathon, maybe it's a double marathon or something. Anyways, then ask them whom they love most in their life and give them this new proposition. So say it's your husband, son, wife, whatever. If you don't run nonstop in the distance that we said, 52 miles, they couldn't do right now. So take that number you can't do. If you can, if you can run that wearing what you're wearing, then I'll take the life of that person. You with me? So basically I'm gonna kill somebody in your life if you don't run that number that you can't run. Invariably, you're gonna be able to run that because you've made the decision that their life means that much to you and you're gonna figure out how to get to that finish line. Suddenly now you have the can and will. Nothing intrinsically changed about you physically, but your mindset changed to a must. There's no such thing in most cases as can't. There's really only will not. Masquerading as weak and unable cannot. So what are you telling yourself you can't do? Change that to I won't. Just say, I won't do that because it's going to hurt because you're taking ownership over that. So instead of saying, I can't, just do it. <laughs> say you can. I'm not telling you to go run 10 miles. I already told you, start slow. In summary, start very slow. Fix your form. Fix your common mistakes, which will result in less injuries. Proper form. Take care of yourself. Drink a lot of water. Hydration is huge. Um, nutrition is huge and start slow and work up to that. That's all for tonight. If you have any questions, message into the chat after I close this video. I'm not going to stay on, but I'll answer your questions there. I'll type the books in there as well. And otherwise, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate you. Love you, Miss You Mean It. Thank you for being an Edge member. If you're not an Edge member, that's okay. We will still be in touch. And uh, the gyms will be open soon. I don't know when that soon means, but we'll see you uh, as soon as we're back. All right, take care, guys. Run strong.